Hilton. I think our last couple uh, couple have been uh, unfortunately through virtual, and we're so glad to have you and look forward to spending some time with you this morning. Uh, with that, uh, two guys that probably don't need any introduction, but for the cameras in the uh, KET, they do. So if you would, uh, General uh, Jones, if you want to start and work your way over towards uh, Corianne and introduce the whole slate, and then we'll turn it over to General Lamberton or whoever. Yes, sir. Brigadier General Retard Charles Jones. I'm Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs. Major General Hal Lamberton. I'm the Adjutant General for your Kentucky National Guard. Corey Ann Jackson, Legislative and Congressional Liaison, Department of Military Affairs. All right, the floor is yours. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. So, Chairman Thomas, gentlemen, lady, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this morning and for, for me to be able to talk about the, the men and the women that we've gotten to the Guard. As I said just a, a moment ago, your National Guard, it, it generally is a, a, a pleasurable item for me to do so. Just quite simply, the, the folks that we've gotten to the Guard these days, the men and the women, the soldiers, the, uh, the airmen, it, it's as high a quality group as I've seen since I've been a Guardsman. So... And as some of you know directly, either through personal experience or indirectly because they're part of your constituency or you've seen them respond in various types of incidents uh, across the, uh, the Commonwealth, even outside uh, the Commonwealth, I think quite simply our folks do a, a terrific job and it quite simply makes me proud to be one of them and to, to serve with these folks. But, but again, as I said a moment ago, th this is your National Guard. And I think for everybody here in the room that we generally have reason to be proud of our, our folks. And, and, and I'm a Kentuckian, and I know that we've got other states out there. I'm biased to the Kentucky National Guard. But uh, genuinely, we've got one of the, the top 10 National Guard states in the entire country. And that's out of 54 states and territories. But, but that said, I wanted to share with you all some of the, uh, the latest things that we, the, the National Guard, have been engaged with. So, so Corianne, if you go ahead and uh, flip forward a couple of slides, I, I think, and I, I know because it's impacted some of you all directly and the, the areas that you represent, your constituency, some folks more than likely that, that you probably know directly. And so wanted to uh, jump right into that. The, the, the flooding that we are still engaged with today you know back in late july when we uh, initially got to the call up to respond to it like uh like many things and and i know that some of you are aware of but the kentucky national guard and emergency management are, are tied together and and i think that's very much a beneficial relationship while on the administrative side emergency management actually is a subordinate organization through the Department of Military Affairs and the Kentucky National Guard when it comes to responding to such an incident, roles are sort of reversed, that emergency management takes the lead in directing what efforts or what sort of response or what sort of resources need to go out. And the Kentucky National Guard is often one of the, the primary responders or sources of the, the resources, that thus in, in this case. So of the, the, the recent flooding that uh, we all have been either engaged with or, or certainly aware of, we first were aware of it of the, uh, the Wednesday prior because of the, uh, the storm front that was coming in and just the projected impact that can have on a lot of the, uh, the areas, the hills and hollers, if you will, which are prone to sudden and flash floods in that area. So, so initially when, and I think it was within the, the first 24 hours that we started alerting our helicopters. And in particular, because we knew that the first type of mission that we would get engaged with would be a, a search and rescue type of mission. And as some of you all are aware of, it wasn't just the aviation assets out of the Kentucky National Guard, but we really saw the escalation of the incident pretty quickly. So within the first 36 hours or so, we 
immediately called upon our brethren in both uh, Tennessee for their aviation assets, also in West Virginia for their aviation assets. And, and so at the, the high point, we had helicopters responding not only from the Kentucky National Guard, Tennessee, West Virginia, the, the KSP, uh, Fish and Wildlife even. We even had uh, aircraft out of the, uh, the Civil Air Patrol. So, so as you might imagine, the aspect of managing all of these aircraft flying in scattered routes, responding to aerial observation platforms, responding to situations that they would cite on the ground where they had to inject themselves for a rescue mission or to relocate folks. That actually involved a fairly complicated aspect. And just to, to add to that, the, the management of what we called an air box, you know, to coordinate all of these flying entities to, to ensure quite simply that one didn't crash into another uh, because this wasn't all necessarily daytime operations. But we also had authorized drones flying in the area. And, and I'll distinguish authorized drones from unauthorized drones. And so that, that actually is a, a big concern of ours at, at this junction. You know, the, the drones themselves is uh, uh, described it as being authorized. Those are, are a very controllable entity. And then you've got the, the folks who are just hobbyists, if you will, go out and buy their own little drone. Wouldn't it be a neat idea if I could launch it and fly it out there to get an aerial observation platform? But it very much is a interfering entity to all the active aircraft throughout the airbox itself. But what I want to get to, and I think a number of y'all are, uh, are tracking this as well, between all of those entities, the, the Guard, the Guard from multiple states, other state resources, as I mentioned, for the KSP and the Fish and Wildlife folks, in the, the next 72 hours, we had, by number, 1,350 rescues or movements of folks from a flooded area to a, a safer non-flooded area. And, and, and I don't know if any of you folks are aware of that. But that's a huge number. You know, on a, a single aircraft, a, a UH-60 Black Hawk aircraft, even with the, the seats removed on the inside, maybe you, you'll get a max load of 10 people. And that's without all the emergency and the, the life-saving equipment that, that goes into it. So, so just do the, the math yourselves. Think how many aircraft lifts that's going to evolve to get 1,350 folks rescued or, or removed from the area. Well, one thing that's really kind of neat and, and uh, to share with you all, we'll see what the, uh, the resolution is going to be with it. Two of our folks, two of our, our flight medics in particular and these are guys who literally and you've seen or i think uh, a lot of you have seen the video clips of the hoist where a hoist would get lowered down to uh, pick up somebody and they either grab onto it or they fit into a, a basket and get hauled back up to the aircraft and inserted in the bed of the aircraft where they're a little bit safer but two of our medics went down on a hoist to rescue some folks and this was a situation in which the uh, water was still rising at one junction. Folks were, were actually trapped inside their, their house, that they weren't up on the roof. They couldn't get up onto the roof. Uh, the, the water literally rising around them. And, and you know, they, they were just kind of waving their hands and arms from, uh, from the, the windows inside. So that's how we knew they were there. Our guys went down, landed onto the roof. And, oh, by the way, this is a steep slick roof and rushing water going by, uh, rising up to the, the roof level. The life of the, the folks inside were being threatened, the lives of our folks, because one of the guys, you know, they came from two different helicopters. So the helicopters can only get so close before they become a, uh, a hazard to one another. So one of the guys actually detached himself from his hoist line, his, if you will, his uh, lifeline, but was just kind of uh, freehanding it there on the slick, wet, uh, steep roof and waited for the other guy to, to get lowered, and they snapped link 
themselves to, together, so at least he had some level of security, that they actually had to break through the, uh, the roof for this particular home. And, and through that opening, they were able to extract the folks, obviously get them uh, hoisted up to a, a position of safety. And it, if I didn't emphasize it well enough already, it wasn't just the, the folks who were trapped inside their house because of the, the rising water around it. It was our medics who also had their lives at risk because of the rising water around it. So, so what I'm getting to is we've submitted each one of these folks for what's known as a, a distinguished flying cross. And if any of you are familiar with that, or if you're not familiar with it, it uh, next to a Silver Star or a DSC, let alone the, the Medal of Honor, it, it's about the, the highest award that the military has for heroism. And it's not just in a combative environment, it's in a, uh, a life-saving environment where you have to put your own life at risk to do so. So two of our folks and and General Jones, who's been around the, the Guard much longer than I could probably relate to this, but I'm not aware of any of our folks, uh, our guardsmen who've ever been submitted for a, a distinguished flying cross. So, so that gets initiated at our level. It gets approved at the, uh, the national level. So, so I won't give you any sort of a timeline for what that approval may be. But I think it's really terrific that we're able to recognize a couple of our folks along those lines. And the, uh, the folks who will be the approving authority for it have already been alerted to it. So they know to uh, receive it at this junction. But, but anyways, that was, that was still phase one. Uh, that was the uh, search and rescue part of it. And, and let me digress for, for a moment. If any of you all have any questions while I'm speaking, you know, don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Just, just go ahead and uh, ask me then. Um, I'm sure that everyone here is much more mentally alert th than I, but I tend to forget things if I talk on. So, so that's where I invite anybody to uh, just raise your hand. As we went into the, the next phase, and as the, the name itself is uh, uh, search and recovery mode. So there's been a, a transition at, at that junction. But one of the neat things that, that I wanted to get to, and some of you all may have been uh, aware of this as well, a anybody ever heard of Cali? Okay, great. Now I get to explain what Cali, who Cali is. Okay. Which one? Cali's in this slide. Middle, middle slide. Okay. So Cali is our canine search and rescue, search and recovery dog. She's part of our STS or our special tactics squadron. She is the only such canine in the entire DOD. That there is no other search and rescue, search and recovery dog in the active duty forces, in the, the special ops forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. There is just one and now actually two in service. And they are also, both of them are part of your Kentucky National Guard. And, and that's where the types of missions, the uh, STS, the Special Tactics Squadron, gets in, involved with. And this gives them a, a unique capability because she was actively engaged with both the um, initial rescue efforts, the <coughs> subsequent recovery efforts. And it wasn't just a response right now to the, uh, the flooding in eastern Kentucky. She was also a, a crucial part early on with the uh, recovery missions that took place in the tornadoes this past winter in western Kentucky. And so, again, I emphasize uh, Canine Cali not only because of her uniqueness inside of the, the Department of Defense, but kind of uh, facetiously, I, I get a kick out of it for the first couple of weeks of the uh, the, the flooding. She was receiving more press than any four-star generals out there that I know of. <coughs> But at that junction, and some of you are aware, so, so we went through the uh, initial 
rescue operations. We went through the subsequent recovery operations, and, and now, and it's still at, at this junction, at this point, is a sustainment dynamic. And, and initially, that, that was very much guard-heavy for the, the number of folks that we had engaged with it, but slowly that, that's tapered off over time, and the sustainment's referring to everything from food to water distribution. We still have three counties that we have a presence today in where we're involved with what we call a, a pod or a point of distribution for the distribution of the supplies that are out there. We're also working with local volunteer organizations or what the, um, the emergency management folks refer to as a VOAD, uh, volunteer organizations against disaster. And, and this is everything from like local church groups or local boy or girl scouts or boy or girls club, uh, let alone to the national voluntary types of organizations. And towards the, the longer end of the, uh, the sustainment effort, and some of you may be aware of this, but I know that t tomorrow, Emergency Management is hosting a long-term recovery program, and this is where they're bringing into uh, together organizations such as FEMA, who that's more so in their lane, and like organizations that will be involved with FEMA, and this is to assist the folks who've had unsurmountable property damage or, you know, can't go back to the lifestyle that they did have. And, and it's not only the properties that have been damaged, but it, as some of you all are aware of it as well, in, in a lot of cases, they can't even go back to their jobs because the businesses where their, uh, their, their jobs were are no longer there. So, so that's a uh, kind of a, a double impact on a, a lot of the folks who've been impacted at this junction. And, and as a, a Chairman Thomas and I were speaking a little bit ago, you know, the, the National Guard, we're spread out all over the state, not just in our units, but where our folks live. So well, what I'm getting to is of all the, the folks that have been impacted by this, we've had 37 of our own guardsmen who've been impacted. And in the case, it's either 21 or 22 folks I know that these folks know that th their property was damaged, but th they still were out there responding as a, uh, a guardsman to help out their communities, you know, literally to help out their, their neighbors in the response. But, but of that 37, it's literally from an extreme where in, in two cases that I, I know of, th their homes have been completely demolished, uh, blown up, flooded away, if you will. To, to relatively minor damage. But the, the neat thing is that there are resources that we're able to call upon uniquely through the, the military to enable a quick resource. And, and when I say resource in this case, I'm primarily thinking of monetary resources to help them out in the, the near term. But, but these folks also will qualify for the, the resources that FEMA is going to be able to bring into our response at this junction. At this point, as I shared a little bit ago, we still have a presence in three counties. And of those three counties, it's quite simply involved with the sustainment action and distribution of water and supplies. Uh, early on, and some of you may be aware of that this is or two lessons learned that we had from the other uh, tornadoes that this past winter number one in every impacted county where we established a lno or liaison officer and we sent for example second lieutenant lamberton out and that lno linked up not only with the, the county emergency manager but the uh, county judge executive, the, the local mayor, when and where appropriate, just quite simply the, uh, the local leadership. Because from my perspective, and, and I think it's proven itself true, it gave the local authorities, you know, their, their own guardsmen, somebody they could reach out to, that they didn't have to call us up over the phone or send in a, uh, any type of uh, email or text through uh, their local emergency manager for some type of request for assistance and quite simply 
th this may sound kind of trite in a way, but I think having the physical presence of a soldier or an airman right there gave the local leadership uh, as kind of a comforting sense. You know, they had somebody they could go to directly to at least they could push their issues or, or whatever needs that they might have through our folks. And that worked off terrifically well from the um, tornadoes that this past winter. It worked out ter terrifically well during the, the current flooding. And we still have folks engaged in, in those counties where we have that presence at this junction. And really, that, that's kind of, you see some pictures here of some of the sustainment activities. And, and quite simply, this, um, th this may sound kind of tried. You may have heard it from me before. You may have heard it from other folks. You may have heard it from the, the governor. But we'll be there as long as there's a need for us to be there. You know, there's not a timeline. There's not a cutoff date for any sort of financial resourcing saying that this is the, uh, the guard's last day. As long as there's a, a credible mission and we're the folks to meet that, we'll be there. So, so with that, uh, Chairman Thomas, I'll open up to any questions you, you or any of your folks may have in regards to our response to the flooding. All right. Senator Higdon, did you, you kind of made notice, was that a comment or just saying you were here? No, I, here and, and, <laughs> and, and, okay. and, and to make a comment, if that's Please okay, proceed. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Thank you. And uh, General Lamberton and General Adams, or General Jones, excuse me, Thanks, and uh, Corey Ann. Thank you all for being here and thank you for all that you do. And, and yes, I, I speak for many of them, say we're proud of our Kentucky National Guard. Um, General, I, I really do appreciate you mentioning second lieutenants. They don't get much recognition <laughs> very often in the, in the press. So I, I'm excited to hear that uh, uh, you mentioned that. They're kind of like freshman legislators. They kind of get often get overlooked. So um, we thank you for that. Sir, that's your arena. I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. Well, I just, you know, everybody starts somewhere, and, and second lieutenants, uh, you know, uh, well, we won't go there. Um but anyway, thank you for, for all that you do. And, and you know, it's often said you can't serve two masters, but um, you do that very well with your uh, president of the United States as your commander-in-chief. And also you have a dual role with the governor of Kentucky uh, being commander-in-chief when you're called in to, to uh, like our western Kentucky and eastern Kentucky um, uh, emergency situations and and I'm uh, you didn't mention it but I'm sure that um, also under your your um, the role of um, being a national organization under the the president you have troops deployed um, across the country and around the world and and uh, I appreciate that mission too and like I said we're very proud of you so I do want to mention uh, Corey Ann too with uh, She's very accessible and, and uh, always willing to help. And thank you, Corianne, for, for your work. And uh, like I said, certainly appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to say that. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I appreciate that. And in a little bit, I am going to get uh, and address the folks that we do have currently engaged with other activities outside of the continental U.S. Great. Uh, we have another question or comment by Representative Wesley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Representative Wesley, and uh, before the redistricting took place, uh, I was over Breathitt, Owsley, and Lee County, Estill County, a little bit of Madison. And uh, about 16 months ago, we, we went through a flooding, and the National Guard was phenomenal there. And uh, this time, and, and I know that all of us have seen on the news and pay, uh, Facebook and pictures uh, the pictures does not, or the videos, uh, really compare to what what has really happened over there. And uh, to give a shout out to all our National Guard, uh, my EMA from Breathitt County, Chris Friley, he just uh, gave me a number, an estimate of how many was saved off the just the roofs by the helicopters and fish and wildlife. He said between 86 and 100. And uh, to see these people at work. Uh, in, in Breathitt County alone, where I was at, uh, just was a mind blower. And, uh, and I appreciate everything you guys done for us and what you do. So that, that's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
All right, we have another comment by uh, Senator Meredith. Comment and a couple of questions, Mr. Chair, if I could. Thank you for your presentation this morning. You know, it's, it's kind of sobering to sit here and listen to everything that uh, you folks have experienced, not just during the Eastern Kentucky flood, but Western Kentucky tornadoes. I don't think anybody ever envisioned uh, that in less than a year's time you'd be facing two of these natural disasters, and the response is incredible. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the situation with the COVID-19. Uh, I think one of the things we learned from that was the importance of our county health departments. We kind of take them for granted. And I think it's maybe the same situation with our, our National Guard. You guys have always had tremendous respect, uh, I think, from our citizens. But I, I admit, I think maybe we take it for granted until we have to call upon your services and you always react and, and you're always there when we need. We appreciate that. But I would think with two of these natural disasters in, in the year's time, it has to be a significant drain on uh, your resources. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and, and what we may need to do in the future to prepare for, for issues like this? Sure, sir. Th thank you. I, I greatly appreciate your sort of opening the door on, on that, enabling me to, to share my thoughts. Um, so... For, for the drain on the, the, the resources, and, and some of you all may be tracking, I, I'm thinking back uh, immediately to about 15, 16 years ago when a lot of the overseas deployments that we went through, they, they were spiking, and not just the Kentucky Guard, but the, the whole National Guard nation, if you will, had thousands and thousands of service members deployed to typically Kuwait or Iraq or Afghanistan. And a, a similar mindset came up there. You know, that, are we overtaxing the, the guard? Do we have so many folks deployed that it's creating a, a strain on the organization or it's not enabling back at the, the state level us to, to respond to any type of uh, uh, incidental circumstance? So to having put that framework to it and in answering it, your question, Senator, that first of all, quite uh, flat out, I say no, that there is not a strain on us, that there is not a fatigue factor that we've hit at this junction. And, and, and I'll qualify that. So like uh, Senator Higdon uh, uh, alluded to a little bit ago, we've got soldiers who are currently deployed overseas. We've got soldiers who are deployed to the southwest border. We've got soldiers and airmen who are projected to go. And what we've been able to do in tailoring and managing our response, especially right now to the, uh, the, the flooding in eastern Kentucky, that those units that are either on the horizon to be deployed or are currently deployed, we have not had to touch those folks. So, so in other words, the, the units and a lot of the folks who you've seen who have currently responded and, and at the, the high point, we were just shy of 400 soldiers and airmen who responded to the flooding. It, it's not overly tapped any of our units to enable that, that response. And, and what I wanted to, to get to as well, and some of you may have heard of it before, in the, the guard world, what we've got what we call an EMAC, uh, E-M-A-C, uh, an Emergency Management Assistance Compact. And so like for, for all of us in the, the southeastern quadrant of the, uh, the country, and some of you all may know this better than I, we have more natural disasters than virtually any other part of the geographic world. Uh, we don't have maybe the scale of uh, forest fires that they do in some of the uh, western coast states, but, but they don't have hurricanes or tornadoes or flooding like we do. But in the southeastern quadrant, but between flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, uh, earthquakes, uh, th there are more that impact our geographic region than not just anywhere in the U.S., but anywhere in the entire world. So, so the EMAC that I referred to, it's basically a list of sharing of resources. And, and you know, it lists uh, essential functions like Army aviation, transportation assets, signal assets, and, and those crucial functions that anybody responding to not just an emergency management type of scenario, but any type of a, a domestic operation 
might need. So say if, for example, we did reach a point here in the Kentucky Guard and, and between folks who are uh, deployed overseas, between a significant weather-related incident, if we have overtaxed our units, you know, just like I offered with you a little bit ago, that, that we're able to call in on the aviation assets of both West Virginia and uh, Tennessee and to our uh, National Guard brothers and sisters from the, the other states, there's a uh, element of reciprocity with that. If they have a situation there and we've got the assets and we uh, once a year identify what assets are available, you know, meaning what assets are, are not deployed overseas, what assets are not going through some sort of modification, but we can offer them up in a, a fairly 24 hours short notice if necessary so the the assets that we've got in the kentucky national guard it's not just reflective of what our force structure is but it's also reflective of all the other uh, states are around us that, that that may go a little further that than you you're thinking uh and asking about uh overtaxing the the resources or a, a fatigue factor but again, I digress to the high point of the deployments 15 years ago, the, the National Guard never got overtaxed. And it's because of the sharing of, of the assets. And, and as you all might uh, expect, and you've probably heard me say this before, I'm biased to the Guard and the Kentucky National Guard in particular, but such a immediate first responder type of sharing arrangement is not prevalent in any one of the active duty components. It's not prevalent in any of the other reserve components. And it's because, as, as you all alluded to, uh, where we serve the two masters, both the, uh, the federal government and the state government, but we have that type of flexibility to respond in each one. We've got the resources aligned well beyond just the Kentucky National Guard that will readily, and as exampled by uh, Again, Tennessee and, uh, and West Virginia will come to our aid just as we'll go to their aid. Follow up, Mr. Chair. How many uh, service members do you have in the Kentucky National Guard? I I'm going to answer you, Senator, but I'm going to qualify that. Uh, so so we've got soldiers, which is the Army National Guard. We've got airmen, which is the Air National Guard. Plus, through, through DMA, which is inclusive of emergency management, our facilities management, administrative, budgetary uh, factors, so we've got about 600 employees. So all that total, we've got about 8,400 folks. 8,400. Yes, sir. Can you speak to recruitment and retention? Because you know, I know that's it's an issue with every employer in, in not just Kentucky, but nationwide. And I know that our, our military has had some uh, issues with uh, recruitment and retention as well. And just wonder what our situation is, your situation is. Sure. And, and, and you've probably heard this and, and perhaps uh, most everybody in the room that I, I believe across all the services, all the components, uh, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, the active duty guys, the National Guard, the, the reserve of each one of the elements, uh, frequently hearing that, that folks are saying that they're not going to make their recruiting mission. And, and from what I've read is that across all of those services and components, this is the first time that they're having these conversations, I want to say since like 1973. And, and that was roughly, uh, let's see, not too many folks here have as much as gray hair as I do. Uh, but uh, uh, that was roughly when the uh, the Army started its VOLAR, our voluntary uh, Army program. It was moving away from the, the draft that, that we heard of several decades ago, and, and that was part of the dynamic. At, at this junction, I believe that, based on, on what I've read, that the active duty folks are not going to make their recruiting mission, all branches. Um the, the reserves are similarly challenged. And the, the, the Guard, and you may have, some of you may have heard me speak of 54 states and territories, a difference for us relative to our uh, active duty brothers and sisters is that we've got to recruit our own. Uh, you know, the, the guys down at Campbell, the, the guys at um, um, 
Fort Bragg. They, they don't recruit their own soldiers. We have to recruit our own here in the Guard. So what, what I'm getting to, it varies a little bit. Here in the Kentucky Guard, I think it's going to be close, to, to be straightforward with you. The, the end of our recruiting year is 30 September. Uh, I, I can give you a phone call on 1 October where we actually have fallen out. But what I'm getting to is not to um, uh, put you off in any way, but say it is going to be that close. Because on the, the flip side, it, it's kind of unique to us, and it wasn't necessarily because of the – uh, recruiting dynamics for the, the generation that we all recruit from, and I'll address that in a moment. But uh, about a, a year and a half ago, you know, we, we were all learning to deal with this uh, thing called uh, coronavirus and finding other ways and, and other ways to do business. And for our recruiters, it meant other ways to recruit. So, so our recruiters uh, across the, uh, the, the entire state, the uh, National Guard recruiters we, we've got here in the state, they, they shifted their efforts because a lot of high schools weren't having in-school sessions. It, it made it more of an issue for us to reach the potential applicants uh, who would have any sort of uh, inclination to join the, the military. But what we shifted an effort to have a, a greater presence for our on-campus college, collegiate recruiting. And, and by virtue of that, I think we've been able to get greater numbers of enlistments. See, we've got a presence on seven colleges, universities here in Kentucky, a full-time presence. And by virtue of that, we've enlisted more uh, from the uh, collegiate ranks, folks who uh, come in, you know, for some aspect of college funding or to to be of service, quite simply. Some folks who are looking for some sort of a uh, uh, aspirational dynamic that they aspire to become a, a military officer and we can pursue that. Uh, so, so that's kind of unique to us and I think it's what's enabled us to be a, a little bit ahead of the recruiting curve across the 54 states and territories. Um, but but again, it, it's going to be close. And that, that's why I say I'll, I'll give you the phone call in one October. Share with me your phone number, and uh, we can do so. Now, to the, the greater recruiting environment, and, and some of you all may have heard, it's the, of, of the, the pool of folks that the military, all of DOD, uh, aspires to enlist. All services, all components of all services, the, the National Guard included. Um, when you filter out that group of late teenagers into the just about 30 or so that you filter out folks for criminal violations, felonies, for drug abuse, um, for I issues of quite simply not having a high school d degree, uh, for issues of being overweight uh, exceptionally overweight, and those four dynamics itself weeds out that potential pool of applicants by age to only 23%. So, so 23% of the, the country that's eligible to, to go into the, the military, or, or I say only 23% of the, the pool by age is eligible to go into the military. And now take that 23%, and for folks who have any sort of aspiration to, to go into the, the, the military, you know, that they, they don't have any moral issues. They don't have any legal or criminal issues. They don't have any height weight issues. They don't have some other dynamic that's holding them back. That takes that 23% down to only about 9%. So, so if you will, of that entire pool of potential applicants, 18 to the 30, only 9% of them is really the, the pool that, that we're effectively dealing with. So, so it is a changing dynamic. Um, you know, the, um, on the, the positive side for economic considerations, you know, all of us see it that the unemployment rate is really low. And so that, that's not necessarily conducive to the folks joining the, the military either. So there, there are a number of factors that do weigh into it. And, and this is how Lamberton's impression, it's not General Lamberton uh, or anybody who's my boss, uh, but 
I think quite simply, the, the majority of folks in our country don't even think about the military. I mean, some of you gentlemen, you served in uniform, but, uh, you know, that, that puts you in the minority. You know, today in, in our current uh, dynamic or demographic for the, the country, less than 1% of the, the entire population is currently in uniform. That's the active duty folks, that's the guard, that's the, the reserve components across the, the different services. We've got 330 million people. So, so 1% of that, less than 1% actually, has direct engagement with the military or the, the families have direct knowledge of it. So easily 99% of the entire country has no direct knowledge of the, the military. And so what, what they know of the military is, you know, what they see off of a, a TV show or a war movie or, or I've got my grandfather's war stories from Vietnam or, or something like that. Um, they really have no idea what military life is like. And unless we can find a way to somehow change that awareness or dynamic, uh, I think there'll continue to be some recruiting issues. That is a significant challenge. Uh, you've certainly done a great job in putting it in perspective. Um, has the COVID vaccine mandate had a significant impact on recruitment and retention? Shoot, sir, you opened the door for me again, so I, thank you. I, I've I got your script up, right here. Uh, Senator Meredith on the agenda, but, but this is working out well. So, so I, I did want to talk about the, uh, the, the vaccination and, and as it uh, applies to our folks in particular. So, so straightforward across the board for the Kentucky Army National Guard, for the Kentucky Air National Guard, our current fully vaccinated rate is about 87%. And, and as some of you all know, that that's higher than the majority of our other National Guard states. Uh, it's higher than the number of folks we've got here in the, uh, the Commonwealth who are vaccinated. But you know, it, it's still less than the uh, desired 100%. And we've got folks, and in the military, some of you are probably aware of this, folks who are, are just outright resistant, they refuse to get a vaccination, they haven't put in for any type of uh, an exception to policy, which the military is working through at this junction, and for the uh, exceptions to policy, or ETPs, as I call them, that they're basically one of two categories. So one is a, uh, a medical exemption, that the other is a religious exemption of the, the medical resemptions, uh, th those are granted for temporary medical situations. And, you know, for example, like the, the first situation I became aware of, a, uh, a soldier apparently had gotten uh, uh, a tick that uh, transferred Lyme disease to him. So, so this guy uh, specifically already had a weakened immunosystem and so to enter a vaccination into his system that could create some sort of a, a conflict just simply didn't make medical sense. So there are temporary medical exemptions. Got no issues with those uh, being granted for folks. I, I do not foresee a permanent, and it's Hal Lamberton speaking, not Dr. Lamberton. I do not foresee a permanent medical exemption because if somebody has uh, unchanging medical affliction, well, in, in spite of their intention, they probably shouldn't be in military service, period. Uh, the, the other aspect is the uh, religious exception to policy. And we, we've got a, on the Army Guard side, we've got 197 folks who've read through that. On the Air Guard side, we've got 36 folks. And I know because I read through every packet myself, just to, just to be able to say that I read through every packet. And so I know what these folks are uh, claiming is their, their issues. An overwhelming majority of these folks the, uh, the issue is with the, the vaccination itself, you know, is because some of you all are, are probably aware they're saying, well, the, <clears throat> the various vaccinations, regardless of which company produced it, originated with um, fetal material. 
and, and that for that particular individual is a moral issue that, that they can't or won't overcome. For, for all the, uh, the ETP submissions that I read through, you know, I'm, I'm not queering or questioning the, uh, the person's sincerity of their religious beliefs. Uh, I'll leave that to the, the chaplains or, or the, the ministers who review those packets at well, and that's done up at the, uh, the national level. Um, from my perspective, it, it's really not a religious issue. It's a medical readiness issue. And, and so I, I'm quite simply sticking with that. You know, if, as I mentioned a little bit ago, we've got soldiers and airmen who are currently deployed. We've got other deployments that are on the horizon. If I send a, a unit out and one person in that unit, for, for whatever reason, didn't get vaccinated, and then suddenly the, they can spread it to other folks who are in that unit, and then it could reach a number, potentially, that that entire mission could be compromised. You know, the unit's not able to stand up to the number of bodies who can go out and perform whatever job for whatever mission, whatever part of the world they may have to respond to. So again, it's a, a medical readiness issue. You know, just anticipating that um, that we might have this conversation. I checked it out just a, a couple of days ago in World War One, and, and and a lot of us are aware of the Spanish flu. And you know, there've been a number of corollaries between the Spanish flu then, and I responded to the uh, uh, coronavirus now. But for all of the soldiers who the U.S. soldiers who deployed as part of the, uh, the AEF, the American Expeditionary Forces, 340,000 soldiers were hospitalized somewhere over in Europe, mostly France, um, because of the Spanish flu. At the, and, and that's a total cumulative number for, for our presence over there. The total number of soldiers who are hospitalized with any sort of uh, combative injury was 255,000. So significantly smaller number had, uh, had hospitalizations were taken away from the, uh, the, the fighting, the, the, the battles that were actually right in front of there than the, the number who had to be pulled back because of the Spanish flu. So, you know, that has a, a huge operational impact. And, and thus, uh, again, my perspective where it's not questioning somebody's sincerity for the, their religious beliefs. And, and you know, in, in the, the military, we generally want folks who, who are very much have strong convictions for military service or, you know, simply being a good citizen, being part of a, an organization. Uh, that, that's the type of person that I, I want beside me. But in some cases, that and military service may simply not be compatible. But, but towards that end, and one final thing is as I wrap up about it to, to share with you, some of you may be uh, aware of the, the latest vaccination that's come out addressing the coronavirus, uh, Novavax. Is it familiar to anybody? Don't see too many nodding heads. So it came out just last month in July. It is under a EUA, but it has no fetal material in its origin. So to, to me, kind of the, uh, the neat dynamic that I'm waiting to see at this junction, we haven't been able to contact the majority of our vaccination refusals or the folks who refuse to, to get the, the vaccination because of, uh, of some sort of religious belief. And we really won't be able to do that until we assemble for the September drill, which will be the, the weekend after Labor Day for the majority of our folks. But, but I, I'm really curious to see what sort of an impact that's going to have on the decision making for a lot of these people. You know, were, were they really just focused on the fetal material and ignoring it because of that? Or will they be more receptive for this other vaccination that's now available? Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, Representative, we're, we're running a little tight on time. Um, are you, you going in a bit at 10 o'clock? No, you're not? Okay, go ahead and proceed then. Okay, thank you. Uh, and and uh, 
General, appreciate your your service. And uh, you know, normally I don't want to uh, try to tell you how to do your job or whatever. Uh, let me say I'm someone who is uh, fully vaxxed and uh, and boosted. So uh, you know, but I think that uh, uh, you know part of the problem that we're, that we're seeing is so much of what we were told we're now finding out was not true. And uh, I mean, even now the CDC is coming out and admitting some of their shortcomings as far as the, what they told us. Um, you know, certainly I understand your example of, you know, maybe sending someone who wasn't vaccinated, but now we're finding out that that vaccinated people will spread the virus too. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I uh, I think that uh, the problem that we that we have is that so much of what we were told wasn't true. So much of what we were told was because of political bias or basis or trying to uh, actually um, force people to do what someone thought that they should do. And uh, I just hope that going forward, we will realize that, uh, you know, everything that we hear uh, from the folks that are in charge uh, certainly is not not accurate and and should we really be forcing people to do something when it's not based on science uh or one person's science so and i don't really want to get into that and certainly i'm not mean to criticize you because i certainly respect you and your and your service but uh this is an issue that's starting to really uh bother a lot of us thank you mr chairman yeah yes sir so so i I will respond to that Uh, um but but you know, I agree with you completely. You're right on the mark. You know, that to the world as we know it today is not going to be the world that we know uh, 24 hours from now, let alone 5, 10, 15 years from now. So so the, the military is a learning organization. This body, the VMAP, is a learning organization. Uh, so, so ideally, we, we learn, we improve, we become more efficient, we become more effective with every bit of uh, a gathered knowledge that uh, comes to us. At, at the same time, you know, that the coronavirus uh, kicked off in our state in what, uh, I think, February of 2020. Um, we were deploying guardsmen overseas then. We were deploying, we've been deploying guardsmen overseas ever since then. So, you know, we, we got to take what we know at the, the time because we still have the, the military, the security, the responsibilities of sending our soldiers and airmen out. So I'll have to go with what I know at that point and pull the trigger on launching the, those folks just to, as all of us have to sometimes make decisions based on what we know at the, the time and contingent upon being a learning organization what we adjust that as we move forward all right right at 10 o'clock we're running just a few minutes behind uh that was a great segue you passed it right back to me that we're a learning organization which means that we have an invitation to go over to uh, the national guard armory i think uh, we're going to catch up with general lamberton in a little bit uh uh, and uh, at this point, uh, if Lieutenant Harvey, if uh, Lieutenant Colonel Harvey, if you would stand up, this gentleman is going to try to get us. This is only open for legislators and centers, and and uh, but uh, we are we're going to be loading a bus uh, as we can make our way down there. Don't go back to your office because you, you get stuck there. So let's make it over there. I'm assuming that we'll have the bus coming back to the same one. So we can leave our coats and ties and get a little more comfortable on the bus. And uh, uh, that way they'll be, but uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Harvey is gonna be our bus captain, kind of show us around a little bit over there. This gives us a chance to go thank those men, these men and women. They've done a lot of work to set this tour up for us. So, so please, if you can, please attend. I think a lot of people have RSVP'd, but if you haven't, come see me or Corianne, and and we'll try to get you in there. Um, But uh, the buses are going to be loading right beside the Rose Garden. Kevin, you're familiar with all that there. So he he checks the roses every now and then, takes beautiful pictures of them. (laughs) But uh, so we're going to be loading up, and we'll have you back by noon. Gentlemen, thank you all so much. And ladies, we appreciate your testimony. We never made it to a quorum. We're going to hold off on minutes until next meeting. And if there's no further business we stand adjourned 
Thanks, sir. Look forward.